Proverbs chapter number 6, begin reading verse number 16. The Bible says, These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet to be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now, Bible, being the Bible, very precise in its word choices. God said what he meant, he meant what he said. God didn't mean what he didn't say. God didn't write down something that he didn't want to say or didn't want to preserve. We know that as the doctrine of the preservation of God's word. But when we get to Proverbs chapter number 6, I also lost a cufflink somewhere between church and home. That's fun. But Proverbs chapter number 6 says there are six things that God hates. Hate, very strong word. Doesn't mean what people think it means nowadays. The true definition of the word hate is the emotion that you feel towards an enemy, an adversary. It's not dislike. I know a lot of people say that they hate vegetables. You don't hate vegetables. If vegetables was the only thing on your plate, you'd eat it. That's not hate. That, that's a preference. You really don't like vegetables, but if vegetables was all you had to eat, I'm pretty sure you'd eat vegetables. Right? There's some people, well, I, I, I hate this or I hate that, but yet they'll tolerate it. That's not hate. That's the way that the world uses the word hate nowadays, but to paraphrase the righteous brothers, that word has lost its love and feeling. People don't use the word hate to mean what hate actually means. If you hate something, it means that you can't tolerate it. It means that you can't suffer it to exist. It means that you won't permit it around you, or if it is around you, you're going down kicking and screaming everything that you can to make sure that it's not around you. It says these six things God hates, and then it says, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Again, very strong word, abomination. If something is an abomination, it's something that isn't fit for everyday life. It's not meant for the common folk. It's something that's too strong. It's something that's too terrible in order to suffer it to be around everyday people. That's why they call him the abominable snowman. Okay, The Yeti ain't fit to live in the city. Right? The Yeti lives up on the mountain and you don't go up to where the Yeti lives or you're going to die. He's abominable. Right? We may not be stronger than the Yeti, but we're staying away from him. He's abominable. Don't go that way. That's dangerous. It's foolish. Right? Don't dangle off the edge of a cliff without a safety net or without a rope to catch you. Right? The folly of many a stunt performer is that they want to make it look real so they take out all the safety measures. But that's a good way to get yourself injured or killed. Right? Why in the world, if you know that it's on fire, would you walk up and grab it? Right? Fire's going to hurt you. Okay? Abominable means that it's got no, there's no place for it in your life. If it enters your life, you're going to drive it out. Don't care if it's the Yeti. Don't care if it's a bear. Don't care if it's a crocodile. If it comes into your life, you're either going to get away from it or you're going to do whatever you can to make it leave. Abominable. But seven things, according to God, are an abomination. You hate things that are abominable. Because anytime they show up, there's always something destroyed. May not be killed, but something's destroyed. But what seven things does God hate because they bring destruction? Because they bring ruin? 
Because they go against the very holy law of God. Seven things. Not a long list. But yet there's seven things that if God doesn't tolerate them, if God sees these things as enemies to His holiness, enemies to His kingdom, if they are hated by God because of how wicked and vile they are, don't you think that God's people should hate them too? If you hate something, you make yourself the enemy of it. You array yourself against it. You're prepared to face it. The whole arm of God was given to you for a reason. Why? Because you're supposed to hate some things in this world. You're supposed to hate people? Nope. You're not going to find that people or nation or nationality or a race. None of that's going to be in this list. What do we hate? We hate the evil that sin has brought into this world. We hate sin. Because sin is the enemy of God. While we were sinners, we were at enmity with God. That means we were arrayed against God. You didn't know you were the enemy of God, but you was on the opposite side of the battlefield. But it was only by His cords of love and kindness that He opened your eyes to that fact and made it known unto you that there was a way that you could be introduced to His Son, the Savior. God did not hate you. He loved you, but He hated the sin in your life. It's because of sin that God can't tolerate someone that's not saved. It's the sin of disobedience for not believing on His Son is the only sin that will send somebody to hell, but God hates them. But they are abominable unto Him. Can't even tolerate the idea of sin. God's so holy that He can't think of committing sin. He can't be tempted to sin. But the very idea of having sin in the camp of God's people, it's abominable unto God. Now that's the kind of hatred, that's the kind of fervor, the passion that these words evoke. Well, let's go down the list real quick. It says, verse number 17, a proud look. Now I've thought about that phrase many a times. Best way to get across to you what I think of when I think of a proud look. There's two. You ever know somebody that's just got a smug face that as soon as they like smirk, you just want to knock their head off their shoulders? <laughs> that's a proud look. It's that arrogance. Right? That snobbish, snobbishness. Okay, but there's also that's something that I hate. That's not something that God hates. In these verses, a proud look, what it's talking about. Let me give you an example. Let's say you labored all day long. Okay. Think of Noah. Noah spent over 100 years building that ark. Noah don't know how to build boats at the beginning. By the end of it, he's built the only boat. But giant boat. But when it was done... Okay, there's three things that Noah could have done. He could have taken a step back and he could have said, man, that turned out awful. Right? The look on his face would have been one of disappointment. That didn't turn out the way that I thought it was going to turn out. Okay, he could have said, well, don't know how we build a boat, considering that the only instructions we find in the Bible are given to him once. Told him how long, how high, how wide. He's told to put a roof on it, right? But really, he didn't get detailed building plans. Okay, he got one commandment, and he lived off of it for over 100 years. That's a different message. But he could have said at the end of it, I don't know how we got it done, boys, but by the grace of God, there's an ark. Right? We didn't build that thing. God built that thing. But it's done. Right? That's a look of satisfaction of contentment or there's you put it together man look at look at that masterpiece that I made but hey everybody check out my ark you don't have an ark like this but come look at the details that I put in over here but I don't find that it was supposed to look pretty I find it was supposed to be an ark didn't study it didn't have a front or a back 
It was meant to be a mirror image. He didn't have a steering wheel. What kind of boat can't be steered? Right? He put a door in it. You know what that is? That's a big old hole in the side of it. Don't know about you, but a lot of boats nowadays don't just come with holes in the side. Okay, those are prone to sink. When Noah got done with it, his look was, Lord, it was a look of obedience. Lord, it, we built it the way you said to build it. In fact, Noah really didn't get to admire it. Why? Because God told him to get in the boat and God sent all the animals in. God shut the door. Noah didn't even finish the ark. God finished it when he closed it. But a proud look is one where you look off at something in your life. You look off at something that you've done. You look at an accomplishment. Couldn't even may not even be yours. Could be the accomplishment of another. But you you let pride well up inside of you, and when you start talking about what your grand youngin did, or what you, your child did, or what your friend did, all of a sudden you start getting a look on your face that says, "Because of what's happened, because of what I did, because of what's done, I'm something pretty special." God hates that look. God hates the look that says there's anything to be glorified in man. A proud look esteems yourself more than you ought to. You can't let pride well up in you, and you certainly won't let pride show on the outside of you if you're very aware of the fact that we are what we are by the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God that we're able to have our own you know, existence, but to have a conscience, an understanding of yourself. I find that Balaam ended up crawling around like a donkey one day, eating grass in the middle of the field. What happened? God took his sanity away for a minute. What are you saying? The only reason that you know who you are today is because God lets you. So how in the world can we allow those emotions of pride to well up in us where we think that we're able to do anything? You want to know what God loves on the opposite side of pride? He loves humility. God resists the proud, but gives the grace to the humble. He saves as such of a contrite spirit. When you realize how little you really are, but then you thank God for all the big things He's done in your life. And even if He uses you in a great way to either impact somebody else's life, or He delivers you greatly in your life, you may have been the tool, but you understand that the master's hand was the one doing all the work. You can acknowledge to others, yeah, God did a great thing, but it wasn't me. But a proud look, the reason God hates it is because we know that pride goes before what? Destruction. God dis disapproves of anything that destroys, that kills. Now Jesus said when he came, he didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. What was he talking about? The word. The sword of God. What does the sword do? It divides. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. John 3, 17. The one that probably should be quoted just as much, if not more, of John 3, 16. God loved you, but God did not send Jesus to condemn you. He sent him to deliver you, not to destroy you, but to give unto you what you could not attain on your own. You know what pride does? It destroys. Pride destroys yourself. We know that if a man thinketh comes up morning out, let, let him take heed lest he fall. Why? Just when you think you figured out how to run, what happens? You trip. Right? The flesh is really good at revealing how inadequate it really is if you give it enough rope. But see, pride also destroys others. If you think that you're the best thing in town, you're going to drag everybody else around you down. Why? For just the chance that somebody else is going to recognize how great you really are. Pride destroys others so that you've got more to take pride in. In what you took from others, what you caused to happen in other people's lives. Pride is selfishness. Sin. The essence of sin is selfishness. 
You cannot be prideful without being sinful. But if you are sinful, there's a good chance that you're full of pride. The two go hand in hand. So why wouldn't God hate? Why wouldn't God consider a proud look to be an abomination? God looks at us in love. When we turn around and we look at others through the lens of pride, we don't see others that we can help. We don't want to bear one another's burdens. We don't want to go out and be used to help other people. We see everybody else that's not deserving of our time. And we want to get rid of them in our lives. Why? Because I'm so special, I just want more time for me. Well, what's the next thing? It says proud look. He says a lying tongue. In fact, God hates lying so much, he mentioned it twice in the same list. If you go down to verse number 19, he says a false witness that speaketh lies. So he hates the lie and he hates the liar. He doesn't just hate the lie, he hates the false witness who spoke it. Now, I know that this is a foreign concept because we're used to people making promises and then not fulfilling them. In fact, we're so used to it that we still elect people to do that. But it's just become a part of everyday life. Right? You're used to the boss saying, yep, this is going to happen, and then by the end of the week, that story's changed, whether it's his fault or not. Somebody higher up the food chain said, nope, we're going back on that promise and something's got to change. Right? You can't even trust that the price of gasoline when you went to work is going to be the same as when you come home from work. Right? We're used to change and we're used to inconsistency and we're used to this world being a pit of lies. Why? Because its master is the father of all lies. So why wouldn't his children take after their father? Why does God hate lying? Because with one lie, you can cover up a little but if you get enough lies going on you can get people so confused they don't know what's up they don't know what's down they don't know what's left they don't know what's right how powerful is a lie brother Jordan well according to your Bible if somebody's raised in a doctrine or a belief system that's not truth the Bible says that they've been made twofold the child of hell a lie can condemn somebody's soul just a much, nearly just as much as the very sin that's going to cause them to go there. Think about it. Somebody believes something other than the truth. You've got to convince them that they're wrong before you can convince them what is right. And then you've got to convince them that they need what you've revealed to them to be truth. But one lie makes the Holy Ghost's job far more difficult. You know who can convince somebody that they need to save you? The Holy Ghost. We know that, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works such any man should boast. We know that. But we also know that no man cometh unto the Father except I draw him. Who's doing that drawing? The Holy Ghost. As great a preacher as we've had staying behind this pulpit, nobody's ever preached good enough to convince somebody that they were a sinner. Nobody has ever sang a song so beautiful that people realized they needed to get saved. Nobody has prayed hard enough to earn somebody else's salvation in heaven. Now, why do we do all those things? Because we know I can't save somebody. But we're told to cast all our cares upon Him. We're told to love and pray for sinners. We're told to pray for our enemies. Pray for those that would, you know, despitefully use us. Why? Because I may not have the power to do anything about it, but God does. But see, if it's that important for God that He doesn't leave up conviction, which is really just a word for convincing, God doesn't let you convince yourself that you're a sinner. No, God does it personally. Through the person of the Holy Ghost. God doesn't want you to believe on what some man said. No, God wants you to believe on what God said. That's why He preserved His Word. That's why the Word is spiritually discerned. So that the Holy Ghost proves to you that what the Bible says is true. Because if God proves it to you, no man can unprove it to you. It's, I know, Ella. You hate being wrong too.
What's the point, Brother Jordan? God considers the truth so much, He is faithful and true. Truth is a part of His existence. It's a part of His identity. It's a part of His holiness. For someone to deny truth is to deny God. The very act of telling a lie, if we really were to break it down, by telling a lie, it means that you don't think God is who God is. Because if He is truth, and you embrace something other than truth, what is it? That's a false God. You're denying God and embracing whatever you've put in its place. So why does he hate the lie? Because the lie is an enemy of him. Because he is the truth. But why does he hate the person that was the false witness? Why are they abominations unto him? Because if, I mean, the Bible talks about, and no, you know, secret way, that God thinks very highly of his chosen servants. Now go look at Moses and, you know, Moses, Joshua, the leaders of Israel throughout history. Go look at what the Bible says about the bishop or the pastor of a local church, God's man, God's anointed. God considers his servants very highly to be respected. In fact, if we're talking about a pastor, the Bible says no matter how much you he's worthy of double honor. But God considers those that He employs and uses in His service, He considers them and regards them very highly. But if God considers those that are faithful to serve and to propagate the truth in that high of a respect, how much hatred and how much of an abomination you think it is for somebody to go out and propagate a lie? Somebody that is a false witness. Somebody that's a lie. That's why there's no little white lies. Right? To lie is to embrace the exact opposite of God. That's why he included them as part of the first ten in the commandments that he gave. Why? Because he hates it. He hates lies and he hates liars, according to our Bible. Both he honors, if he says that they're Works do follow them because they invested in the truth. We're surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses who, what, who were entrusted by God with the truth. Then were instructed to go out and to spread it. And it's been passed down to us. Now we have that responsibility. Why does God consider that so precious and such a noble work? Well, if we go to somebody who propagates lies, what are they propagating? The exact opposite of the truth. Is it any wonder that God hates liars and false witnesses? Because everything about their life testifies to the fact that they don't believe in a God. They don't think they're going to stand in front of a God and give an account for their sin. They don't think that there's any reaping for what they've sowed. They believe that they can be who they want to be, when they want to be. And God loved Brother Thad, who sent me a wonderful news article yesterday. Yeah. There's some bozo who's a dude who thinks he's a woman and he wants to be the first dude that thinks he's a woman to go have an abortion. I said, I'm pretty sure the only abortion he could have would be a self-abortion, which I think is called suicide. You say, what's going on out there in the world? A whole bunch of lies. What do lies bring about? More lies. And if people hear enough lies, they're liable to believe anything. You're no different. It's only by the grace of God that you weren't deceived or beguiled by a lie. Right? And again, God hates a proud look. Don't look down your nose at somebody else. Eve, who walked with God, talked with God, saw everything in the spiritual realm, was still beguiled by the serpent. You know what that means? She was deceived or she believed a lie. She lived in a world where she knew no sin until she what? Sinned against God. So even in a perfect environment, 
Somebody that never had sin. Somebody that up to that point didn't understand what sin was. That's what the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that's why it was that tree. Because in order to take the fruit, you had to disobey God, and you became, you learned what unbelief. You learned what a lie was. You learned what sin was by doing it. The fruit of that tree didn't make you any smarter. Didn't open anything up. God, it, nothing special about that tree. I guarantee you. It's just a tree that God said, don't touch it. Don't touch fruit of it. Don't eat it. Not, you can eat anything you want to. Not that fruit. Then what happens? They disobeyed and what? They realized they had sinned. Because for the first time, they weren't in perfect fellowship with God. That's the knowledge of good and evil. Well, what's the world try to do? Lie and cover it up and say there's no consequences for living the way that you want to? God hates that. Because all it does is deter, distract, and defame the name of His holy begotten Son. Well, there's no way we're going to get through all this. It says... Verse number 18, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Do you realize that you should hate your own heart? Not according to Brother Jordan, according to God. Because your heart's deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. If you're part of mankind, that means you don't even know what's going on in your own heart. And you ought to thank God for it. Because if you knew how wicked your own heart was, you wouldn't be able to get over it. It would cripple some people to know what they are capable of. What is man capable of? Debaucheries and horrible things that we've, we've seen in histories how wicked man... Wicked, man's more wicked than that. You understand that once the rapture happens and the Holy Ghost's presence is removed from this world, it's going to be worse than anything anybody has ever dreamed up or imagined or seen or beheld or recorded in history. As bad as World War II and the Holocaust was, it had been a whole lot worse without God's presence still in the world. The only thing keeping this world from going completely insane is the presence of God's Holy Spirit. But God hates those that just sit around all day dreaming up things that are more evil and more wicked and more debaucherous than before. The Bible's got a word for that. It's called lasciviousness. God's got a whole lot to say about that. Well, it says, a heart that devises wicked imaginations. That's why God wants to give you a new body one day that's just like His. So you don't have to deal with a heart that's been corrupted by sin. Yes, we're in this flesh still. Yes, we can rule and reign over this flesh. But one day He wants to separate you from the shackles of this flesh. The marks that sin, being born into sin, being a sinner by practice and sinner by trade, he hates that you have to be confined to this fleshly body now because He already sees you seated in heavenly places. He already sees you as you will be, robed in Christ. He wants you to get to where He sees you now. Why? Because He knows it's going to be perfect. Because that's the final fulfillment of God's will, that those that are saved are conformed to the image of His Son. What's it going to be? It's going to be awesome. You don't understand how awesome it's going to be. But at the same time, if you don't remind yourself that if you let this thing in the middle of your chest, the heart, the seed of emotion, if you let that drive you around, you're going to end up in some evil and some wicked places. Because your heart left to its own devices, it's going to wreak a whole lot of trouble. Why? Because there's evil in there that even you don't understand. And by the grace of God, hopefully you never will understand. Because if it took over, it'd make a mess of everything. It says in verse number 18, feet that are swift in running to mischief. Does God say that He hates all feet that end up in mischief? No. In fact, God promised that if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. After you get saved. When you know better. After you've been redeemed. God understands that we are not perfect yet. So what did he do? He made a way so that Christ not only had the blood shed to save you, but the blood shed to keep you saved and forgive you for all the sins you'd commit after you got saved. 
What's that contingent upon? You humbling yourself, repenting of it, and confessing it to God so that it can be covered by the blood. But it says feet that are swift to run to mischief. Noah did not know that after being on the boat for a couple months, bottled up, tucked away someplace safe, I'm sure, to keep them from cracking or keep them from spilling, that the grape juice that he put onto the ark had fermented and turned into alcohol. Moses didn't know that. Moses didn't put the wine on the ark so that when the wine came off of the ark, he could drink it and get drunk. That was not the purpose of it. In fact, he used it as what? A token of celebration. He saved it until the end. What he want? Jesus went and turned the water into wine. The master of the feast said, why did we save the best for last? But the whole point of grape juice or wine is that it's supposed to be sweet. It's supposed to be refreshing. That the fruit of the vine was meant as a joyous thing. Why? Because a whole lot of effort had to go into it to get it. And to get it from the vineyard to where you're at so that you can drink it without it going bad, without it getting contaminated, getting it there quick enough so that it wouldn't ferment. That wine was a celebration, or a picture of celebration. That that rotten wine that Noah had, that wasn't his intent. That's why God knew he didn't hold it against Noah's a sin. Right? What was the sin that his son wickedly beheld his father's nakedness that his other two sons had enough common sense to approach him backwards and say hey something not right here but let's save dad the indecency of running around like a wild man okay let's turn our backs so that we don't behold what it is but we walk and we lay a blanket over him without ever seeing him then we take him in and we cover him up not get him cleaned up Figure out what all happened. Because that's not like Dad. That's not normal. Noah didn't plan on running towards mischief. But mischief found him. What happened? God explained it. God made a way for it not to happen again. And Noah purposed it in his heart that he never would do it again. It's for him that knoweth to do good. And doeth it not that it is sin right, God is a just God that's why those that pass into eternity before they reach the age of accountability what's that mean they don't know the difference between right and wrong yet Ella don't know what right and wrong is she just knows that when she's hungry she screams when she's unhappy she screams when she wants something she screams she just knows that's the way to communicate right now and her dad thinks that she sounds like an air raid siren and it drives him nuts. She don't know better right now. Don't hold it against her. God doesn't. But when you realize the difference between right and wrong, you know what mischief is, you know what right is, and you know what wrong is, and your feet still swiftly take you to mischief. God hates it. Because you know it's wrong. But I just want to watch what's going to That's mischief. If you hang around wrong long enough, you're going to end up in it. No matter how long you try to tiptoe around it, one day you're going to fall into it. You know what mischief means? It means it's causing problems. Well, I didn't do anything. doesn't matter. You're causing problems. That's what mischief is. Dennis the menace, full of mischief. But what did he do? He caused a whole lot of problems for Mr. Wilson. Well, I didn't mean to do it. doesn't matter. It was mischief. You caused it to happen. I didn't mean to throw a ball and break somebody's window. It doesn't matter. You threw the ball in a place where you know you shouldn't have been throwing a ball. That's why the window ended up broke. I didn't mean to get hit by a car. Well, it doesn't matter. We told you not to play in the street. You was involved in mischief. That mischief is going to find you in life, but those that swiftly run to it, God hates those feet. Why? Because he knows only on the other end it's problems, it's destruction, it's divisive. Nothing good ever comes of mischief. You don't read about heroes and 
comic books or in movies or anything else where mischief is one of their best qualities. Right? Mischief is never in a good connotation. But it means that they're curious, which I find that if you ask, you shall receive. If you seek, you shall find. If you knock, it shall be opened unto you. God's not against curiosity, but they're just curious in all the wrong things. What's it bring about? Mischief. God hates feet that swiftly run towards mischief. Because they know that there's problems down there. They're hoping that they don't become a part of the problem, but they want to see the problem. They want to be around the problem. They want to be close to those people. What happens eventually one day they become a part of them people. You can only knock somebody up the head so many times before they do something that hurts themselves. That's why God hates those feet that swiftly run towards mischief. Then we skipped over those that, the hands that shed innocent blood. God's always been against murder. God was against murder before Cain ever raised a hand against Abel. You know why God hates murder so much? Because as a result of man's hands committing sin, the hands of man took hold of the Son of God as he laid his life down and nailed him to a cross. It is because of man's hands that Christ had to shed blood to cover up for their bloody crimes. I mean, the Bible does say that if a man lusteth after a woman in her heart, that he is guilty of the sin of adultery or fornication, even if he never committed the act. But if in your heart you've ever desired truly to do harm to another, are you not someone guilty of having bloody hands? Not all of us guilty of some point. I'll give you a real good example. When somebody cuts you off in traffic and you want to hit, you know, give them a pit maneuver on the back quarter panel, you know that if you actually did that, you'd hurt them, but yet for a split moment you desire to do it. But it doesn't say shed the blood of those that are deserving of it. That's not murder. That's called judgment. God said that there are certain things that if you broke His commandments, it's guilty and punishable by death. Sometimes even though you did it, your whole family had to die to make sure that the wickedness didn't spread. Nip it in the bud, as Barney Fife would say. It says the hands that shed innocent blood. Every time I think of that verse, I think of the slaughter of the innocents with Herod, where he slaughtered all the children in his domain two years and younger while trying to kill Christ before the king could come and take his throne. After the Magi didn't come back by, he said, well, it was probably about two years ago that that boy was born. Kill all the youngins, the males, two years and younger. Like God sent Joseph dream that hey get down there to Egypt for a little bit I'll tell you when to come on back what's that the children didn't do nothing but yet a whole generation died out why because of one man's pride and his fear hands that shed innocent blood but then finally, it says, verse number 19, He that soweth discord among the brethren. New Testament, we don't have time to quote all of them or look it up. Go read Paul's epistles. How many times are you going to see that it's his desire, which if he desired it, it's because the Holy Ghost birthed that desire in his heart. And if the Holy Ghost gives it to you, it means that God has the same desire. So how many times... Did the Apostle Paul say that he desired for the church to be of one mind, to be in one accord, to have this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Right? That they, church, being fitly framed together, dwell in unity, not in division. That the church not just be unified in 
a location, unified in spirit, unified in purpose, unified in our mission for the mission field that God has given unto us. That in everything we do, we be unified behind Christ. The Bible does say how sweet it is when the brethren dwell in what? Unity. Everything that Christ did was to bring man to God and then after man was brought to God, he takes those people and he brings them together. That's called a church. Okay, out of those churches, he brings people, some of the best friends that you're ever going to find, you're going to find at the house of God. You know a real good way to lose those friends? Stop doing what God wants you to do. They're not friends because they love you. I mean, I love a lot of y'all. But the rest of y'all love y'all. Right, it's not that I find you a remarkable human being. Okay, I love you because I, we've got a kindred spirit. I've got something on the inside of me called the Holy Ghost that says, hey, that person loves God just like you love God. And God loves them just like He loves you. And what's He do? He just knits our hearts together. Right, people that, you know, you've seen it happen. Preachers we've never met before, but a pastor met at a meeting. He comes in and what? It's just like he's been preaching here for years. Right? Church just falls in love with him. Some people, even though we don't want to love, we still keep loving them. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? The love of God will cause you to love God's people. It propagates. You know what love bears fruit of? Love. You put love in the ground, guess what's coming up? Love. You put tomato seeds in the ground, pineapples aren't coming out. If God puts his love in people, guess what? The love of God is going to bloom in their life. If they plant love in their life and in other people's lives, guess what's coming up out the ground? Love. Unless you have... Here's how important love is. God said, Christ, one question, what's the great commandment? Eh, all the laws fulfilled in this one right here. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Your heart, your soul, and your mind, that's what people get caught up on. Oh, well, I, I just can't stop thinking about this, can't stop desiring this, can't start. Hey, I got a real easy solution. He said that the solution was to love God with those things. I've said it for years. If you love right, you'll live right. Because if you love him the most, guess what? He's going to get your heart, your soul, and your mind. Because where man's heart is, where his desire, where his emotions are, that's where his treasure will be also. If you love God the most, everything else is going to take care of it. Now, we know we ought to have faith. The woman said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Lord, I love you, but help that part of me that doesn't love you. The part of you that loves God, that's not the problem. It's the part of you that doesn't love God. Why? Because if you love God, you love God's people, you love God's house, you love God's word, you'll love everything about God. You know what the exact opposite of love is? It's discord. Love brings together. God's love brought you to God. God's love for you gave you a place, a church, where you could be a part of a called out local assembly. What did he do? He brought people together. He sends people out in the community to tell what? About the love of God, the gospel. Why? So that others can be brought to God. God's all about inclusion, not exclusion. But what is discord? Discord, I'll give you a real good example of discord. If Brother Clint and the possums were to get up here, and everybody's playing in the key of G, and then out of nowhere, somebody hits an A sharp, it's going to sound real weird. It doesn't matter how many of them were playing the right thing, that one person hitting the wrong thing throws the whole thing off. You don't hear all the things that went right, you just heard the one thing that went wrong. That's discord. Discord is the exact opposite of what you expect, the exact opposite of what God desires. 
And you know what it does? It rubs everything the wrong way. If things are cordial, you know what that means? Everybody's in unison. Everybody's flowing the same direction. You know what discord is? It's somebody trying to walk down the hallway. Now, you ever seen? Every now and then I'd do it just to be fun because I thought it was fun back in high school. If I get a certain look on my face and I walk at a certain speed, people just get out of my way. <laughs> Still true to this day. I can do it in Walmart. Right? If I'm at a mall, people are like, we go to Disney or whatever. And they're like, we need to get over there. And I'm like, just follow me. Nobody ever follows me. <laughs> or they start and they're like, oh, but we saw something. I'm like, you didn't tell me to stop. I kept going. I made a hole and y'all could have had a clear path the whole way there. But nope, you stopped and now I'm over here by myself because everybody got on my way. That's just something I can do. But if everybody's walking in one direction and you just take one person and throw them right down the middle, walk in the opposite direction, it causes a whole lot of discord. For everybody else to get out of the way, what do they got to do? They got to bump into other people. They got to knock them off course. They got to slow everything else down. Why? Because one person won't be different. Those things that creep into the vineyard unawares, those things that drive wedges into the church, you know how they start? Something real small just moving in a different direction. Move in a different direction of what God wants. You know what God hates? He hates people that sow discord. Because if everybody's doing one thing and you try to do something else, you know that you're not in cord with everybody else. You guys know what a C chord is? C, E, and G. You throw any other key in there, it's not a C chord. Discord is anything that's not a part of that chord. I can tell you which three, it's these three fingers right here. I can hit them on a piano keyboard. You know why that is? Because that's what that chord is. You know what discord is? Anything else. So you can t hit one of them notes, you can hit an octave higher, octave lower, dumb it's still part of C chord. There's people that are different. They sound different, they talk different, but what? They're still a part of the same chord that God's playing in inside of the church. But there are other people, it don't matter how high or how low or which angle you hit it at, it just sounds wrong. Well, if it looks like the world, acts like the world, smells like the world, sounds like the world, of the world. If it looks like God, sounds like God, if it's in harmony with the things of God, if it goes the same direction as the things of God, it's probably of God. Because the only thing that can consistently do what God wants it to do is something that God owns. The power of the flesh, you can do something for a little while. But without the power of the Spirit, you won't consistently do it for God. Or you'll do it, but you'll do it for the wrong reasons. Go back to a proud look. God hates those that sow discord among the brethren. Why? Because God intends this place to be a place of peace, a place of love, a place of hope, a place of encouragement. Things that build up, not things that cause disunity, not things that destroy, not things that rub the wrong way. Why? Because God called us to Him. Why? So that we could have all of those things. So that we could have a solid rock. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.